On this Tuesday night, Justin Trudeau makes one of the biggest bets of his political career, putting billions of your tax dollars and a whole lot of political capital on the line to build the controversial Trans Mountain Pipeline. We're looking at this risky move from all the angles. What's at stake for the industry that's supposed to foot the bill, for opponents who promise they won't back down, and for leaders in Ottawa, B.C. and Alberta. We'll break it all down with At Issue. Chantal, Andrew and Althea are all here tonight. Also tonight, we're learning more about that hack of 90,000 bank customers. What could criminals do with that information? And the Roseanne reboot cancelled. It had re-emerged as one of the most popular shows on North American television, but ABC pulled the plug just hours after a racist tweet by its star. Should we be surprised, or was it just a matter of time? This is The National. For months, the federal government has said the Trans Mountain Pipeline is in the national interest, that it will be built. Today, Ottawa backed that promise up with a cash offer, buying the controversial project and the baggage that comes with it. So, is this a sound investment or a big political mistake? Let's start with the details of the deal. The federal government has reached an agreement with Kinder Morgan to purchase the existing Trans Mountain Pipeline and the infrastructure related to the Trans Mountain expansion project. Ottawa will buy the delayed project from Kinder Morgan. The price tag, $4.5 billion. That's taxpayer dollars the Liberals are spending to ensure the pipeline expansion goes ahead. It could spend billions more in construction. In return, Kinder Morgan has agreed it will go ahead with its original plan to twin the pipeline this summer while the sale is finalized. The government says it doesn't want to be a long-term owner, though. It's already looking for other companies and investors to eventually take it over. It's an agreement that we believe will deliver a real return on investment for the benefit of British Columbians, Albertans and all Canadians. But one that's a big gamble that the government hopes will pay off when it cashes out. So a big gamble for the government and also for the Prime Minister when it comes to the politics of all of this. And that's where Katie Simpson begins our coverage tonight. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, Call it the start of the Prime Minister's reassurance tour. Justin Trudeau is reaching out to business leaders at home and abroad to urgently make the case that Canada is still a politically stable place to invest. We're demonstrating that, yes, we will do what we need to do to get projects that we properly approved built. <laughs> Alberta Premier Rachel Notley is happily echoing that message since this is a big win for her and her province. There is work yet to be done, but Alberta, this is a major step forward for each and every one of us. But BC's Premier doesn't see it that way. John Horgan says a change in ownership changes nothing for his legal case against pipeline expansion. I will continue to work for the people of British Columbia with the full force of uh, my efforts within the courts and within the rule of law. The stakes are high for the political leaders in this three-way standoff, but the Prime Minister may be the first one to feel significant consequences in the polls in the next federal election. Well, I think the Liberals just lost every seat in B.C. This is now the people of B.C. protesting the government of Canada that wants to proceed with a project that ignores our concerns. And when Trudeau returns to the House of Commons... Prime Minister, is your political career at risk over the decision you made today? He'll be exposed to fresh criticisms from the Conservatives. He has still failed to create certainty in the Canadian energy sector. Using taxpayers' money is just Justin Trudeau trying to buy his way out of his own failure. And accusations of betrayal from the NDP. Giving $4.5 billion to a Texas oil company is a failure of leadership that shows that Prime Minister Trudeau has no vision for the future. Trudeau and members of his cabinet are headed to the oil patch to promote the government's decision. The finance minister will do the same thing, but on the international stage. He's hosting his G7 counterparts for a series of high-level meetings later this week in British Columbia. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. As you saw in Katie's story there, Alberta's premier is certainly pleased. Rachel Notley's government is ready to put in $2 billion itself for unexpected costs to make sure that pipeline gets built. The CBC's Aaron Collins is in Calgary with how the deal is now being received by the industry. 
Summer is construction season in Canada, a short window to get a whole lot of road work done. Same deal for the pipeline industry. It's why Kinder Morgan set that May 31st deadline for clarity on the Trans Mountain expansion. Now for the Alberta government, today's purchase of the project by the federal government also bought clarity in spades. To all Albertans, pick up those tools, folks. We have a pipeline to build. <laughs> So, today's deal should get those tools moving in time for this summer's construction season. The big question, whether the $4.5 billion price tag is worth it. It's hard to say a good deal today. Experts say the Fed's probably paid a fair price if the line is completed on time and on budget. A big if with billions left to spend on the pipeline and more political hurdles ahead. It's an important thing because a lot of things can delay a project when it's partly built and you've got 700 people in the field ready to work. If you have to send them all home, that costs a lot of money. Now we've seen this story before from Hibernia to Petro-Canada. The federal government has waded into the private sector in the past, often turning a profit in the process. And insiders say this deal needed to be done to settle skittish investors worried about spending money in Canada. The big worry now, what nationalizing this pipeline will mean for future energy projects. The risks have become almost too too impossible for the private sector to handle. And, and, and that's something that everyone should be reflecting deeply on today about how did we get to this state of affairs in Canada. Well, the fate of future projects in Canada may be difficult to predict, but if all goes according to plan, Trans Mountain should be pumping more oil to the coast and more cash into government coffers by 2020. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. Now, the federal government made it clear today it doesn't want to be the long-term owner of this pipeline, so it is already actively looking for a buyer or buyers instead of just one company. It could be a group of investors from, for instance, a pension fund looking for a long-term investment with some low risk, a First Nation or First Nations, a group of them, oil shipping companies trying to get that stuff to market, and energy companies, other ones, or possibly even Kinder Morgan itself. Who buys the pipeline makes little difference, though, to those who feel it shouldn't be built. And many are in B.C., where the pipeline would end. Briar Stewart now with the opposition. We're all here fighting to protect the sacredness of Mother Earth. Can I hear some noise? A few hundred gathered in Vancouver to do something they've been doing for months, protesting the Trans Mountain you. Pipeline. But tonight, noise? much of their anger is directed at the federal government. This will be uh, go down in history as a very bad move, for, especially for the Liberal Party. They, they will have lost B.C. The fact that Trudeau is supporting it now does not mean that we're going to back down. It's actually the other way around. We're going to keep our fight and it's going to get more intensified. Across Burrard Inlet lies Tsleil-Waututh Nation. It's fighting the pipeline in court and officials say they'll continue to do that even though it's the federal government that's now building the pipeline. It's ridiculous because they're, they're supposed to be looking out for the best interest of Canada and our future generations. <laughs> BC's Lower Mainland remains the key battleground when it comes to this project. There are concerns about an increase of tanker traffic and what impact a spill could have on the province's coast. Many are irate that the government is financially supporting an oil pipeline and Canada has said it wants to be a leader when it comes to the environment. Even if it was a good investment financially, it's never a good investment to violate Indigenous people's rights and fuel climate change. But just over 100 kilometres to the east on Chiam First Nation, there's a much different attitude when it comes to this project and the government's commitment to it. So it comes right through our traditional territory. Chief Ernie animal Cray animal signed a lucrative benefit agreement west, with Kinder Morgan, which he says will now be honoured by the federal government. On top of that, he says, band members will be employed in building the pipeline. I hate to think of, of what would have happened if... Um, Kinder Morgan went away and there was no plan to make sure this pipeline is built. It would have impacted this community in a profound way. Recent polls found that more people in BC support the project than are opposed to it, but the numbers aren't overwhelming. Two polls peg support at about 55%, which means this province is still very much divided over this pipeline. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. 
So what could throw a wrench in potential construction? Well, Breyer mentioned there that several First Nations say they weren't adequately consulted as required by the Canadian Constitution. A decision is expected any time now from the Federal Court of Appeal. And if the judges rule in their favour, it could send the pipeline, or parts of it anyway, back for assessment, more consultation, a move that would cause lengthy delays. As for the B.C. government's legal question on if it has the right to put restrictions on moving diluted bitumen through the province, well, there's no timing on how long the province's top court may take to schedule a hearing, let alone release a decision. So it's pretty clear there's a lot at risk here, both politically and financially, which brings us to the analysis. Andrew, Althea and Chantal are all here for a very special at issue. Should the Liberals be worried about their political fortunes? Should you, taxpayers, be concerned about your return? We'll unpack it all a little later on The National. First, here's a look at what else we're working on tonight. ABC cancelling its hit reboot of Roseanne. How a racist tweet killed one of the most popular sitcoms on network TV. And race and racial, bi racial biases are at the heart of why Starbucks shut down thousands of its stores today across the U.S. We'll take a closer look at anti-bias training and whether it could backfire. We have new details tonight on that Canadian bank hack affecting tens of thousands of customers. It appears the hackers are making good on their threats to release sensitive customer data. CBC News found some of it posted online. In all, the personal information of 90,000 customers was compromised at Bank of Montreal and CIBC's Simply Financial. And as Aaron Salzman tells us, the hackers have also revealed how they got access to it. They're offering 100% of the money lost, but... Simply Financial customer Evan Cosner got the bad news on the same device he uses for his banking. We got this notification yesterday saying that hackers have potentially taken over uh, your account and uh, it could be cause for concern. Already, the hacker's handiwork is showing up online. CBC News found a list of 100 names, BMO customers, their bank account, debit cards, social insurance numbers, home address, occupation, marital status, even their air miles number, out there for all to see and anyone to use. In an extraordinary twist, the hackers revealed how they got the information. In an email, the hackers say they used an algorithm to get account numbers, then they posed as authentic customers who had forgotten their password. That, they say, allowed them to reset the backup security questions and answers, giving them access to the account. Some experts say banks aren't doing nearly enough to protect customer information. There's things that they can do such as simple items as encrypting the data that you hold on your servers, that even in the event of an accident or a malicious act, that data is not going to be useful for anybody that gets access to it. When they do get access, in most provinces, there are no rules forcing companies to notify consumers of a security breach. We have no idea of the size of the problem, how many companies are having trouble with this and um, how many records of people's personal information are lost every year. Too many for Evan Cosner. Well, you're remarkably calm given that all of this is going on. Again, I've been through it three times this year. <laughs> That's right. He was also caught up in hacks at Home Depot and Nissan. Now he can add his bank to the list. Aaron Saltzman, CBC News, Toronto. Security experts often give the same and important advice. Monitor your account activity. Consider paying for one of those services that will notify you when someone applies for credit under your name. Have unique passwords for different accounts. Change them often. Why? Well, here's what hackers can do with your personal information. The kind of data the hackers say they have stolen is valuable in two ways. First of all, it is financial data. It can be used to buy goods online like electronics, which are then resold. Even more anonymous criminals can buy gift cards, and then in turn, it can be used to buy resellable goods. But it gets worse. This is the kind of sensitive personal information that can be used to take over a person's identity. So having your name, your date of birth, your social insurance number allows criminals to apply for bank accounts, credit cards, but also to rent rooms, get cars, equipment, all in your name. Because many of us tend to reuse or only slightly vary our passwords, knowing a password for one account can help a hacker get to or at least guess others. The data in this breach can also help craft convincing emails that can prompt you to click and download malware. That's called spear phishing. 
if they get a hold of email or social media accounts, they can then use that tactic on your contact lists and leapfrog to your friends, other victims, and then on to even more. But these hackers seem to want their cash fast, and this may not be the only scam they've got going. They want the ransom paid to this digital wallet in the cryptocurrency known as Ripple. It's been active for weeks, and there's already millions of U.S. dollars worth in there. If you are a BMO or Simply customer, you're probably wondering whether you're affected, and in particular, whether you're on that list of 100 names that Aaron mentioned. Both banks say they have been contacting affected customers and that they will fully reimburse any losses. BMO telling the CBC in a statement that it's blocked online and mobile access to affected accounts, so if your card stops working, call your bank. Free credit monitoring services are also being offered. Let's move now to a story that got a lot of people talking today, the rise and fall of Roseanne. Her character, Roseanne Connor, was brash, opinionated, and a diehard Republican. But those qualities got the actor, Roseanne Barr, in big trouble on Twitter today. In a few words, she went too far. She posted a blatantly racist tweet. And ABC abruptly canceled her show, calling what she wrote repugnant. Here's Stephanie Skinderis with what happened and what might come next. Dan! I thought you were dead! For two months, Roseanne ruled the ratings. 30 years after the show first premiered, audiences ate up the reboot, led as always by the character Roseanne Connor, now a proud supporter of Donald Trump. How could you have voted for him, Roseanne? He talked about jobs, Jackie. Roseanne Barr shared that support. She wasn't shy about posting controversial tweets, and she didn't mince words. If you say that you're a supporter of Donald Trump or... Oh, yeah, people are mad about that. Yeah. But, you know, I don't give a... <laughs> The show dealt with issues like health care and education in an effort to depict real working class families in the U.S. Well, I wanted to show an accurate depiction of our country. And we all have the hope that people will start talking to each other again, because that's what we need. Yeah. The U.S. president seemed to recognize the impact. Even look at Roseanne. I called her yesterday. Look at her ratings. Look at her ratings. Today, that all came crashing down with an early morning tweet about Valerie Jarrett, former senior advisor to Barack to Obama, comparing her I'm to an fine. ape. The backlash was immediate. Within hours, the president of ABC policy. Entertainment released a statement announcing Roseanne was cancelled. Critics say it's a necessary move in a new era. We already have seen this happen with the Me Too movement, right? I mean, I think that corporations are finally waking up and thinking that all of a sudden they can't just think about the bottom line. They need to think about matters of justice and matters of responsibility. Now, Barr has been dropped by her talent agency, and reruns of the show have been pulled from networks. You can't live in the past, Dan. When things are gone, they're gone forever. But just as it brought John Goodman's character back from the dead, Roseanne has a history of revivals. I think within the next 48 hours, we're going to hear that uh, Roseanne, that the show will be renamed The Connor Family. The Roseanne character will be killed off. It'll probably open on a funeral. Barr apologized to Jarrett on Twitter today. Stephanie Skanderis, CBC News, Toronto. Up next on the National, Starbucks shut its doors across the U.S. today for staff to discuss racism in their outlets. A look at uh, what one day of training can actually achieve. And the death toll in Puerto Rico jumps from dozens to thousands in the wake of Hurricane Maria. What it all means for the situation still on the island. But first, we meet the new recruits preparing to protect their First Nations from wildfires. It's pretty important because uh, I want to make my mom happy and sure that I can do what she did. Across the U.S., more than 8,000 Starbucks outlets shut down this afternoon, but workers didn't get time off. Instead, they were asked to think about bias and how they treat people who are different from them. Workers at Canadian stores get their session June 11th, all aimed at showing Starbucks' commitment to diversity. It's a good stance. I think they need to get some training in there, obviously. I don't think it's something that you can just throw four hours at and then say everything is going to be okay. Tonight, our business correspondent Jacqueline Hansen examines bias training, whether it works and how it can backfire. But first, a reminder of how this became a pressing issue for the coffee giant. 
What did they get called for? Because there are two black guys sitting here meeting me? Two black men arrested because they didn't order anything or because they were black. Well, what did they do? What did they do? Did someone tell me what they did? Starbucks apologized to the innocent men, but the damage was already done to the accused and to the company's image. So Starbucks promised to do more to address discrimination. Today's racial bias training is made up of a message from the company's founder. I want to ask you that together. From the rapper Common. Helping people see each other fully a documentary on feeling welcome. I watch my tone to make sure that I don't come off as threatening. And group discussion. I had to deal with difficult homeless customers all the time. A grand gesture, but can it actually change company culture? Trainings can raise awareness around topics, but ultimately we're looking for behavioral change, not just Wow, this was a great training. Shaquille Chaudhry has been doing unconscious bias trainings for almost 25 years. This session is with employees of the city of Cambridge, Ontario. Everyone has biases. Uh, they're mostly unconscious. They're biases where we have been socialized to favor those most like ourselves. His training sessions involve open and hopefully honest conversations. The first words, thoughts, or images that jump to mind for you when you're Islam or Muslim. Oppression political, mosque. But Chaudhry says industry-wide training standards don't exist. Anyone can call anything a diversity training. It can be sensitivity training. It can be multiculturalism. Research shows even implicit bias training can have unintended consequences. A lot of the backlash that we see from diversity training tends to come because people feel like they're being coerced into it. Sonia Kang studies race and discrimination in the workplace. We can also see um, stereotype rebound effects where we actually see increased rates of stereotyping and discrimination after diversity training than we did beforehand. A big part of At Chaudhry's training, acknowledging biases is part of the process. It's painful to have to acknowledge just how pervasive this is in our society. I do a lot of hiring. I think it is in inherent in a lot of our processes. And real behavioral change takes time. Starbucks training day may have been a quick response to a major public relations problem, but the company says it has plans for much more than today's half-day session. In the coming weeks, months, and years, we will address many other facets of what makes us truly human. And train its baristas to serve not only coffee, but also inclusiveness. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Ahead tonight on The National, she has been casting her ballot for more than 75 years, and she has a message for anyone in Ontario who's thinking about not voting next week. You'll hear from Mildred in our moment of the day. Can't wait for that. First, though, you'll hear from Andrew, Althea, and Chantal. The government can't buy a pipeline without calling these guys in for action. You don't want to miss at issue. Tonight on The National, a horrific attack in Belgium and questions about why a man shot and killed three people, including two police officers, before being gunned down himself. He'd just been let out of prison on a two-day leave, and investigators are reportedly looking into whether he was radicalized while he was behind bars. They're calling this a terrorist attack. We know there are people out there who know who did this, and it's time for them to do the right thing and come forward. And police say they still don't know who was behind last week's bombing at an Indian restaurant in Mississauga. But they now believe one of the two suspects may be a woman. We're just getting a look at new video today, appearing to show the two of them running away after setting off that homemade bomb. In all, 15 people were hurt, three of them quite badly, but all have since been released from hospital. division among provinces, such as the dispute that's arisen between Alberta and British Columbia, cannot be allowed to fester in our country, especially not when the resulting impasse threatens both the livelihood of thousands of workers and Canada's solid reputation as a good place to invest. 
I was Finance Minister Bill Morneau in Ottawa this morning after announcing the federal government had struck a deal with Kinder Morgan to buy the pipeline for $4.5 billion and build an expansion, a decision that has deepened the divide between two neighboring provinces. What does it all mean politically? We called an emergency session of At Issue to break it down. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal. And Althea Raj is here in Ottawa. Start with you, Andrew, because I watched your Twitter account throughout the day to see where you were going with this. Um, does the federal government buying a pipeline make sense? Does it make it less risky and more certain that it's actually going to happen? Uh, there's three questions there, then. I know. Uh, just take one. <laughs> uh, at most times, it would not make sense. Uh, in this particular circumstance, with the political risks around this, it may well. But it comes at particular risk, uh, certainly to the government and also to the taxpayer. The risk to the government is they become responsible for a quagmire, where they are running a pipeline, owning and building a pipeline, uh, where the costs are mounting, where they're having trouble with protesters, for example, uh, and where they start to really wear this. Um, the upside from the standpoint of pipeline proponents is it's more likely to get built at this point. The government is certainly, I think, committed now beyond any shadow of doubt uh, that it wants to see this built. Chantal, what do you think? Hopefully it's committed, considering how much money it's willing to put on the table. Uh, I think it came down to you either saw what you saw this morning or on Thursday you watched Kinder Morgan pull the plug on mm -hmm. uh, the expansion of the pipeline. Those were the options. Clearly the government's offer of a safety net uh, in case there were delays caused by court cases, etc. Uh, was not going to be taken up. Uh, Kinder Morgan, it seems, wanted certainty. Let's be clear here, no government today of any stripe could provide certainty because the court process, the demonstrators, are all beyond the control of a prime minister regardless of its, his constitutional powers. So the risks are all, all now on Canada's taxpayers and the political risks for the prime minister uh, are much higher than they were a week ago. Although we, we've looked at this on this program before last week, uh, we looked at other cases where the federal government has bought into invested in energy projects. And in all the cases we looked at, you get a return. So so the, the economic risk, I don't know that it's that high, Althea. I mean, of course, anything's possible. But what about the political risk for the federal government here? Well, I think there is a political risk, and you saw that by the fact that it wasn't Justin Trudeau, the prime minister, fronting this announcement, but the finance minister, Bill Morneau. Uh, the prime minister had no trouble 18 months ago uh, standing in front of reporters in the National Press Theatre, the same uh, forum, and to make the announcement that the Liberal government was going to approve Kinder Morgan. So I think that they themselves view this as uh, somewhat politically risky. They have 18 seats in British Columbia. This is incredibly unpopular in BC's lower mainland, and this has been a bit of a gift, frankly, to to Jagmeet Singh, who's been struggling to make any inroads. So uh, it's good news for him. I think that there are risks, uh, financial risks, of course, as the uh, Chantal and Andrew have outlined. I think one thing that is notable from today's announcement is that the government re refused to actually say how much they're ready to invest to get this pipeline built. The $4.5 million billion dollars, rather, is just the cost of the existing pipeline and the permits that have been um, obtained to build the expansion. It's not the cost of constructing, mm -hmm. which Kinder Morgan had pegged at $7.4 billion mm -hmm. in December. The government, through, you know, uh, officials that meet with you but don't speak on the record, they don't have their names attached to it, acknowledge that that figure is going to be a lot higher. And they acknowledge that this is probably a medium-term hold. This is not mm -hmm. something that they're actually realistically looking at getting rid of before they actually have to pay for it, which is a scenario they outlined for us today. So I, yeah. the chances of finding a buyer yeah. before August are incredibly slim. They're, they're slim, but they're already trying to do it actively, and there are already some conversations happening around that. Is the political risk, was it bigger to buy the pipeline, or was it bigger to walk away from it, Andrew? I think to, to allow the pipeline to just, you know, not be built at this stage mm -hmm. would have been, not suicide, but it would have been extremely damaging to the government after the many yeah. statements they'd made that it will be built. The trouble is, of course, they boxed them into a corner that way. They made it very clear to Kinder Morgan that they would do whatever it took to see that it was going to be built, including relieving Kinder Morgan of any of the risk or costs and, and taking it on themselves. So they kind of painted themselves into a corner. I wondered, though, too, Chantal, whether it in some way validates uh, and it's a question, I'm not saying that it does, but does it validate the process they used 
to uh, give the project the green light. So that if there are future uh, projects that have to be considered, then they can say, well, this worked, and, and here's why. And so then that gives oh. them some... I, I, I'm, it's a question. Hi. It's a question. Excuse me. <laughs> I'm not even going to go there, because if that <laughs> is the proof that it worked, that we are actually, we as taxpayers, mm -hmm. buying a pipeline, uh, and then the government of Canada becomes uh, judge and jury as to whether the construction meets all the conditions mm -hmm. that it imposed on the pipeline. Boy, I mean, that's, you know, uh, I, I, I think this entire saga actually is becoming a textbook example of why we probably will not have any more of these pipelines to Tidewater built uh, uh, in the near future. Now, that being said, it is possible over time that Canada would get a return or some of yeah. its money back or most of it back. But Justin Trudeau is racing against a different clock, which is called the election clock, and he's not going to have that proof by 2019. Yeah. He's probably going to be in the middle of uh, protest demonstrations, pro possibly some clarity from the courts. But this will remain a thorny uh, issue for him going into the election. That, that's an yeah, awfully good point. May yeah, I go, just go add ahead. the yep. other thing that, you know, the Liberal government has made this first mandate about has been about the energy and climate change. And it would have yeah. been really hard for the Prime Minister to go to the polls in 2019 with only the carbon tax as part of that equation and no pipeline. But the danger between the protesters and the mounting costs and the election is that they'll be just as motivated sellers as they were motivated buyers. And that somebody <laughs> will come along and just take them to the cleaners uh, but with a lowball bid and they'll They'll, t they'll be willing to do so to get it off their plate. Okay, let me play this clip of uh, Premier Notley, Premier Horgan, and do one round on, on where this leaves both of these premiers after this. Look. Now we have both Ottawa and Alberta. Rather than going to court to determine jurisdiction, uh, they're making financial decisions that affect taxpayers, and they'll have to be accountable for that. After all, this is not a conflict between provinces. BC took a run at the authority of the federal government and the interests of all Canadians. So we challenged the federal government to step up, assert its jurisdiction, and do whatever it takes to give investors the certainty that they need to see this project through. Althea, you start us off on this. Where do you think this leaves these two premiers? Um, certainly it looks like one's a winner, but I'm not sure it's, it's that clear cut. I think Rachel Notley has basically gotten everything that she wanted to get out of this decision. Absolutely. She has uh, new life, perhaps, and re-election uh, possibilities. It would have been a, a real disaster for her not to get this pipeline built. For John Horkin, he doesn't really lose anything either, frankly. Mm -hmm. I mean, the political risks have not been eliminated. The government announced today that it is not pushing forward with legislation to reassert its authority, which is something they had announced they were going to do back in April. And I think some people might wonder why the government is not asking the Supreme Court to look at the BC reference case because uh, it looks like you know, there are legal issues here that have not been resolved and the federal government perhaps is suggesting that it is not entirely confident in its case by refusing to fast track that. Chantal, what, what do you think this changes for those two provinces, those two premiers? Uh, I think uh, Rachel Notley got what she needed. I'm not sure that that will necessarily translate into re-election. That's for mm -hmm. the people of Alberta to decide. But the reverse would have been a catastrophe, and she would then have had to pull her support from uh, Justin Trudeau's carbon pricing uh, plan. So confrontation would have escalated. Yeah. I think John Horgan is basically where he was before. He has made a court answer. Uh, his way out of this. He has uh, a Green Party gun to his head if he wants to keep his government uh, in office. So he's pretty much today where he was yesterday. Andrew? Uh, I think this has made it slightly more certain that they will not face legal obstacles to this. I mean, it'd be one thing for the courts yeah. to say you didn't have jurisdiction over a private yeah. corporation, but to say that a federal crown corporation couldn't do this, I think is even less likely. But again, it's the political commitment as much as anything, and Rachel Notley will certainly be I reassured by this. I think the chances of the pipeline being built, while there's by no means uh, out of the woods because of the, some of the uh, protesters, for example, and some of those uh, challenges, uh, but it's certainly materially improved at this point. 30 seconds. I don't know if we can do it in 30 seconds. Do, do, are, should taxpayers be worried today about this investment? Chantal? Not yet. Uh, we did buy something, an existing pipeline for that money, and presumably it's been making money. So I, I think at some point down the line, possibly, but for now, what the government has done is put an existing project on, on a lifeline, waiting to see if it will survive challenges and demonstrations.
Okay, 10 seconds, uh, Althea and Andrew. Well, I think there's still unknowns, right? We don't know how the Federal Court of Appeal is going to rule. There are things that Kinder Morgan has not yet done. The 157 conditions, not all of them have been met. There are permits that have not been applied for. So the federal government is not getting, like, a, a pipeline ready to be built. Uh, there are still headaches there. Um, so we'll see what happens. But I, I think that the, the taxpayer, I think right now the question is, why is the government not being transparent with them about the cost of this project? Andrew? There's huge risks. The, the costs could mount way beyond what we've been told so far. Uh, and we may, as I say, they may wind up selling the thing at a loss. So, uh, yes, they're buying an asset, but one of uncertain value. Although I think if they resell a, a little portion of that pipeline to all of us, or let us put autograph it, you know, they might get taxpayer <laughs> buy-in that way. All right, no, in, case you. you're, <laughs> in case you're wondering, Addy Issue, all of these uh, lovely people will be back again on its regular day on Thursday to discuss whatever we come up with for Thursday. Thank you all. Just a reminder, Addy Issue, also a podcast. Lots of extra content and, of course, the main panel in podcast form every week. Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. If you think you've heard this debate before, well, keep in mind, politicians have been fighting over pipelines in Ottawa for the better part of a century. In fact, one of the most famous confrontations in Canadian parliamentary history is known as the Great Pipeline Debate of 1956. An $80 million loan is essential to the builders, an American-dominated company. Liberal Trade and Commerce Minister C.D. Howe decided that a pipeline to carry natural gas from Alberta was a national necessity. You say this was the toughest fight in your political career. Oh, by far, yes, by far. Howe wanted to create a crown corporation to make sure construction on the Trans-Canada Pipeline could begin that summer of 1956. All this sounding a little familiar? Vital interest to Canada under the ownership of a crown corporation. To guarantee the summer construction season for the workers who are counting on it, 60 years ago, the debate in the House of Commons was one of the nastiest on record over concerns that taxpayers' money would help big oil in the United States. Liberals, though, used their majority to ram the pipeline through. I feel now that the pipeline bill has gone through the House of Commons. Well, it's a great relief. We've had three weeks of debate. The fact is, it's not the members of Parliament whose rights have been denied, it's the people of Canada. And uh, there's been no discussion allowed. In the end, a 3,700-kilometer pipeline was built. TransCanada eventually became a Canadian-owned private company. That pipeline debate, though, cost Louis St. Laurent's Liberals dearly. They lost more than 60 seats in the 57 election, and progressive conservative John Diefenbaker became prime minister. And lots more to come here on The National. Fire season hits hard and fast on the prairies. And heeding the call to action, a number of young Indigenous people handpicked to help protect their communities. Yeah, of course I was scared. Yeah. You never know what's going to happen in 10 minutes from now or one hour from now, what the fire is going to do. The weather can change. It's still early in the season, but already parts of Western Canada are burning. Right now, there are well over 100 active wildfires stretching from B.C. right across the prairies. This one in east-central Manitoba is among the most threatening. It's already charred an area more than half the size of Winnipeg, and it is out of control. Hundreds of people from two First Nations have had to flee, many airlifted to safety, but now holed up in hotels, waiting for news about their homes. And in Saskatchewan, they've also been dealing with a much harsher fire season than normal. Conditions are tinder dry, and consider this. Normally by this time of year, the province will have spotted and battled around 155 wildfires. This year, they've already counted 200. Fighting all those fires can stretch crews thin. But this time around, there are dozens of new recruits on the front lines, and ones specifically chosen by their First Nations to help protect their own communities. Olivia Stefanovic caught up with them. Deep in the boreal forest, a tactical formation pumps water from the lake to quench the brittle earth. So you gotta lean into it, right? Yeah. Danae Ballette was chosen by her band for a seasonal contract to learn how to become Saskatchewan's human defense against wildfires. 
you never know what's going to happen in 10 minutes from now or one hour from now, what the fire is going to do. Even after a little rain, the ground is still quite dry. Without more moisture, it could be a busy summer for these new recruits. When the material in the forest is that dry, any source of ignition will start a forest fire. Cliff Bittner has battled wildfires in the province for over 40 years. The current conditions even have him concerned. He says the new firefighters he's training will be critical. It's a competitive opportunity and it's competitive in a lot of communities because of the lack of employment. A rare opportunity to make money and save the land. It is their traditional land, it is their home, and they want to protect it. The new recruits will join 300 others. Most are young and indigenous. Bilat is one of the few women. Uh, it makes me feel good about myself. It makes me feel that I can do what just any, what any other guy can do. At age 24, she already has big plans for where this experience can take her. I never seen many uh, crew boss ladies or any particular thing like that. And that would be a goal for me to even have my own crew of all women. Another recruit, 21-year-old Nicolas Francois, was inspired to take on the challenge by his mother, who fought wildfires for over 20 years. And I want to further her career, and I've never had a father figure, so that's what I'm going to do. Long, difficult days lie ahead with immense pressure. How important is this? It's pretty important because uh, I want to make my mom happy and sure that I can do what she did. Still, they look forward to joining the front lines. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Lac La Plange, Saskatchewan. More than eight months after Hurricane Maria ripped Puerto Rico apart, we still don't know how many people died, whether by the storm's wrath or its aftermath. The official estimate currently being revised is small, 64, but today a new figure, more than 4,600 people. A detailed estimate from Harvard researchers that is so much bigger than the government numbers and a signal there's still a big problem in Puerto Rico. If you look at a real catastrophe like Katrina and you look at what happened here, you can be very proud of all of your people, all of our people working together. It rang like a mission accomplished moment from the U.S. president. His visit to Puerto Rico last October suggested a real crisis had been avoided. But just a month later, CBC News saw something different. Homes destroyed, their owners devastated. My brother. Families living by flashlight, struggling with heat and mosquitoes. Hospitals still mopping out dirty flood water. A chaotic time to figure out a clear death toll. So researchers tried by surveying more than 3,000 random households on the island. And from that, they determined that between the time Maria hit to the end of 2017, the death rate in Puerto Rico was 62% higher than the previous year. That is where the more than 4,600 figure comes from. So our data shows that the people of Puerto Rico suffered so much, you know, lack of medical treatment. For example, if you were a dialysis patient, there wasn't a dialysis machine working for months at a time. You know, diabetics couldn't get their insulin, and if they get it, they couldn't refrigerate it because there was no power. A government-sanctioned study is expected later this summer. For now, as these numbers are out, a new hurricane season begins. Tonight on The National, we are waiting for word on the status of a possible strike by Canadian Pacific Railway workers. A strike deadline had been set for 10 p.m. Eastern, but... No details yet from the workers' unions or the company on what's happening. If workers do walk off the job, the railroad may be forced to shut down its freight service and its commuter service, too, in Toronto and Vancouver may be disrupted. And in Ottawa today, a scathing review from Canada's Auditor General of the Phoenix payroll debacle. The Phoenix project was an incomprehensible failure of project management and project oversight which led to the decision to implement a system which was not ready. The decision to launch Phoenix was wrong. In his report, Michael Ferguson said public servants had uncovered issues with the project, but because of the, quote, obedient culture in the public service, 
those issues were never properly flagged before the project's launch. And he says this kind of failure could happen again if the culture doesn't change. With nine days to go until the Ontario election, we want to introduce you to a woman who remembers her first trip to the voting booth in 1928. Yes, you heard that right. Mildred Margulies went with her mother, and she wants you to know voting is important. And this is our moment of the day. If you feel that certain people are crooks and you don't like their face, don't vote for them. I was born the 5th of December, 1922, which makes me a very old lady. I'm lucky to live in a country that doesn't care what I am and that I can vote. I never tell anybody who to vote for. If they ask me what I think of certain people, I will tell them. People have died and gone to prison and done all sorts of things for the right to vote. If things don't go the way I want them, then it's, it's partly my fault because I didn't pay attention. We get the government we deserve. So uh, she has some pretty clear feelings about the importance of voting, but it actually may surprise people to know that she still hasn't made up her mind who she's going to vote for this time around. She knows simply that she will be voting, and she knows where she'll be voting, too. The polling station happens to be in her building. Well, it's a pretty bananas Ontario election, so I can understand why she's holding on a little longer. Just to remind people, the last federal election I checked is about 68% voter turnout. Not bad, but could be better. So this is a good message for anybody, really. And people wonder often, you guys know this, does their vote matter? But think of the pipeline issue that's going on mm -hmm. right now. In British Columbia, the Green Party more or less holds the balance that's of power right. in the province. That's because a certain number of people voted and did something people didn't expect. In Alberta, it's an NDP government, so I think voting does matter. Of course it does. It's that great. That is the national great. for May 29th. Good night. Good night. Good night.